Well, let's pray together to begin. Lord, we do thank you that we can come to you in worship and with every request and every need of our hearts, that everything that we encounter in life, that you are there as our provider and our protector, and our guide. I do ask that your spirit would be upon this teaching time, that you would speak to each of us individually, just wherever we are in life. Lord, that you'd give us um, a clear sense of your presence and your purpose for us as a church and as individuals, that we might honor you in all things. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Well, as you know, I've been stretching out this series on maturity as long as possible. No, that's not purposeful. It's just happened that way. But I am going to finish this month because we have something else planned starting in August. And the last time I was teaching about a mature witness, the idea that you and I are called to be witnesses of Christ in everything, in all things, in every circumstance. And we looked at the scripture in Acts where it says that the disciples asked this question to Jesus about was he going to restore the kingdom of Israel, which was a very reasonable question in light of the fact that he had been crucified, he had arisen, he had demonstrated his power and authority, and they naturally assumed he was then going to make Israel the preeminent nation of the world, that there would be a, a time sort of like when King David was king. But instead, he answered them very differently. Instead of saying, oh, yeah, this is going to happen, he said, nope, you don't even need to know the time for that. And instead, he said, when the Holy Spirit comes, you will be my witnesses to Jerusalem, to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. In other words, that God was going to use them, not in some earthly government and some kingdom that would have authority over the land, but rather he was going to use them to bring the truth to every, per every person throughout the world and they would be the witnesses rather than Christ himself, that Christ would be the witness through them. And so the reality is that every person who comes to know Christ and has the Holy Spirit dwelling within them is in the same position as the early disciples, and that is that you and I are witnesses. That is, everything that we do in life, every place we go, what everything we say, that we are a witness of the reality of Christ. And frankly, sometimes there are Christians who are poor witnesses because they have chosen to rebel against God and they're living in such a way that doesn't demonstrate his reality. But to the extent that you and I are consistent with his will, then we are the true witnesses to the world around us. And God calls us to be witnesses who are people filled with love for every person that we encounter. You realize that there are many times that God crosses you with the path of another person. Maybe you don't say a word to them, but God is using you in some way to influence their lives. I remember many, many years ago, I attended a basketball game at Central High School, and I went there to watch this young man who was in the youth group that I was teaching at the time. And um, I just sat with a friend, and beside me sat a lady that I did not know, and I was just courteous and spoke to her and briefly, but it was nothing significant about it. And then later, and this had to be the Lord letting me find out for some reason, later I found out that this lady had had a conversation with somebody else and asked, who was that man? What was going on with him? There was something different. And that was about it. She appreciated that there was somebody who showed her respect and kindness and whatever it might be. And see, I had no idea. I wasn't really even paying attention. I was watching the basketball game. And God uses us as witnesses. Now, by the way, in that case, the third party who found out about this was able to say to her, well, he knows Christ. And you see, God uses us in ways that we don't even know, but we are his witnesses. And so the scripture we also looked at last week is this, where it says that we are to be prepared at all times to give an answer to those who ask for what is the reason that we have a hope within us, and to do so with gentleness and respect. In other words, all of us should at any time be able to share briefly and concisely what it is that Christ has done for us and why our hope is in him. And we do so not with sort of an, a confrontational attacking methodology, but rather with love and respect, with gentleness. 
And really, I mentioned last week this poll I had seen where it said that many people want Christians to talk with them because they want to know what they believe. And if you do so with respect to any individual, regardless of their belief system, you'll probably find it easier to do than you might imagine. I've said before that if you encounter somebody who's a bit confrontational or they have uh, beliefs that are very different from you, pretty much all you have to do is ask questions. Just ask them, well, tell me about your beliefs. Instead of putting them on the defensive, invite them into a, a conversation that is healthy for both of you. Because if you invite somebody else to, to share with you their beliefs, it usually leads for the opportunity for you to share yours. And I don't tend to say this is what you must do or put people in a position like that. Rather, I say this is what Christ has done for me. And that testimony is your truth. Nobody can say, well, that's not true for you. No, it's your truth. And so we are called to be witnesses. And you know what's been a really pleasurable thing is in the last few days, I've had several people share with me how God is exactly doing what we were talking about, putting them in places where they're having the opportunity to talk with people, some with very different beliefs, but in healthy and respectful ways. And God is clearly using them in a measure that is good. Now, I said last week when I was talking about the idea of witnessing or evangelism that that's one of the things that tends to make Christians uncomfortable, that we feel like we don't do that right or we don't know how to do it or whatever it might be. And I said one of the other areas that tends to make us uncomfortable is what? Do you remember what I said? Nobody remembered last night either. I was saying briefly in last week that one of the other areas where we tend to be uncomfortable is prayer. That we tend to think, oh, I don't do that long enough, I don't do it right, or something like that. And so to keep with this idea of making us uncomfortable, I want to talk about prayer this, this week. That is maturity in prayer. Because I am convinced that the spirits of evil have many of us confused, maybe even self-condemning in this area of prayer. That we have a wrong perception about how it works, what it's about, what the purpose is, what our goals are that we then assume that because we have these false perceptions that I just don't measure up. Now, I want to go back and start with this scripture in Philippians where it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So it says that in every circumstance, with prayer and petition, petition meaning asking and so forth, that you are to present your request to God, and the peace of God which transcends understanding, will guard your heart and guard your mind. Now, when it says guard your heart and guard your mind, I take that to believe that it means to guard your emotions and to guard your thoughts, to help you keep focused on thinking the way that you should think and that your emotions wouldn't be out of control even if you're going through a very, very difficult situation. That God's peace will transcend and give you a peace that passes understanding. I've talked to many people when they've had a loved one who was either dying or had just died, and they would say, I have a very clear peace. Because that person knew the Lord, they knew the Lord, they realized that, it, that God had appointed this time for them, and this peace that passes understanding was in their hearts. I've also been around people who were in situations that were less stressful, who were more more disjointed or upset in terms of their emotions than were reasonable for the circumstance. They had no peace. But it says that this peace is a consequence of prayer and petition. Okay. Now, when I first became a Christian, I sort of assumed, somewhat based on teaching, but maybe partly on my perception of things, that prayer was about informing God about what you needed, doing so in the proper way, so that eventually he would do what you wanted him to do. I mean, that's what I thought prayer was. That A, God was sort of like asleep on the job, and you had to yell at him enough to wake him up and say, hey, I need help down here, right? Maybe badger him a little bit, and finally he would go, Oh, okay, I'll pay attention. What do you need? And then I thought that there was a system to it. In other words, I had to do it 
with the proper methodology. And I'm, I remember even reading things about this is how you should pray and you should use this framework. And I would use this same framework and I would be very repetitive about it. And I thought if I did that, then I would, I would have it right. And I heard this teaching very early when I was a Christian that you should read your Bible for an hour a day and you should pray for an hour a day. So I thought, yep, I'm going to do that. And I could read for an hour a day, right? But trying to pray, at least the way that I thought I should pray at that time for an hour a day, was pretty much impossible because I went through a list of everything I could think of to pray for, and in 12 minutes, I was done. You know what I mean? And then I would start maybe praying for the Aborigines or something. I don't know, anything. I didn't know what to, what to pray about. And... But I felt like, well, I never quite measure up. And, the, and where I learned that teaching was from a well-known pastor. I won't mention his name, but, but I was thinking, man, he must be really good. He could do that for an ent entire hour, and here I am, you know, just can't even get close. And, and so for a long period of time, I thought prayer was about meeting the quota. You know, if, if I could tell God what I need do it the right way, and do it long enough, you know, meet the quota, then he would be happy with me. Because I had a, a business background, and we talk about quotas and so forth in business settings, and I'm like, it's the quota mentality. And if I could do all of those things, then God would do what? What I wanted. I mean, that's what I thought prayer was, is you tell him what you want, and he would do it for you if you do it right. Now, the problem with that whole mentality is what? Well, it was all about, A, what I wanted. Very selfish, very self-centered. B, I could never meet the quota. I just never measured up. And C, some of the things I was asking for, they weren't going to happen because they weren't God's will, right? Right? And so then I was disappointed thinking the problem was me. I wasn't doing it well enough. Now, does that not describe a lot of Christian people? That we pray for things that we want. It doesn't come about the way we want. We think the problem is us. And we have a mentality of, I just don't pray well enough. And we think, now there's some people though, like that pastor I heard when I was a new Christian. There's some people though, they, they've got it. And they do it right, and God just always blesses them, and whatever they want, they get. Now I was in a business setting, it was actually earlier this year, and uh, I was talking with this gentleman who I know, or somewhat, and we have a mutual friend, and the mutual friend had had some sickness, and he was asking me about the person and so forth. And toward the end of our conversation, there were a couple other people there. He's, we were just talking about, I said, you know, let's pray for him. And earlier in the conversation, this guy, now he's got a sort of a strong personality, and he's a good dude. And he said, by the way, you know, my prayers are good, as good as yours. And, you know, he, he knows I'm a pastor and so forth. He said, but, but my prayers are as good as yours. So at the end of this conversation, when it came time to pray for this gentleman, we started to pray, and he was looking for me to pray, and I just looked at him and said, your prayers are as good as mine. You pray. <laughs> so first of all, it is true, I am absolutely certain, that nobody has a superiority in prayer. In other words, there's not somebody else who just has it down. And that they're like Elijah, and whenever they pray, it rains, and it doesn't rain, just based on whatever they say. You know, I just don't think that's the way it is. I don't think anybody has superiority. Because the Scripture says it doesn't separate out any individuals to say that now Paul and the disciples can pray at all times, but you people, you only get Wednesdays, right? It says in everything. Now, does that exclude anything? No. In everything with prayer and petition. Okay, so does that mean that in everything that I'm constantly badgering God to get what I want? Is that how it works? I mean, I do believe a lot of people have the idea that, it, that you have to badger God long enough until he is tired of listening to you, and then you'll get him to do something. Sort of like I was in Lowe's very recently, 
And do you know that Lowe's has committed the same sin of Walmart and many of these other places? That they now have candy and drinks and stuff right at the checkout area? Now, I don't think they used to do that. I'm pretty sure they didn't. But Lowe's has it just like anybody else. So I was at Lowe's and I was checking out. And behind me was what I figured out later was a mom, her two kids, and grandma. Okay? And I'm checking out, and all of a sudden, this little boy, who's probably six, maybe something, seven, something like that, he saw something on the shelf that he wanted. I think it was a blow pop or something. And he's like, oh, I want that. I got to have it. Can I have that? Can I have that? And, you know, he started a little at a, at a low decibel level, you know. <clears throat> he wanted it. But the interesting part was he didn't ask mom. He quickly circumvented her and went straight to grandma, right? The kid knew what he was doing. I see some of you looking at grandmas right now going, yep, you would have capitulated. But he did. He didn't ask mom. He went straight to grandma. Oh, can I have to come out of that? Before grandma could answer, and I could see she was weak, right? <laughs> Before she answered, mom intervened and said, no. What do you think he did? Oh, okay. No, that's not what he did. The decibel level went up. He's like, oh, I, 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 well, please, I want to have the, can I have the, can I have the? He's like, Grandma, Grandma. He's, he was pretty loud, you know. And I'm watching this now intensely because I think, now what is going to happen here? Grandma was just so ready to give it to him. And Mom was like, no. I could see Grandma going, boy, she, mm, I, Of course, Mom is doing the same thing that Grandma do when, did when she was younger, right? But anyway, he goes into all this little tirade, and mom said no, and they marched out without buying it, right? Now, he quieted down as he's going out of the store. He saw that it was ineffective. But now, I'm sure in the right moment, he will attack grandma again when mom's not around, right? And grandma will give in. How many of you grandparents would have given in? Let's be honest. Yeah. It just, there's something in the grandma gene that changes. It just, poof. All the things of discipline that you had when they were, your kids were young, you're like, ah, I was too hard on them. I'm going to make up for it by really being lush with the grandkids, right? I better not spend too much time on that, though, right? But anyway, now, the reason I tell you that story is I think a lot of people think that's what prayer is. I'm like, oh, God, please give me this. Oh, I've got to have it. i got to have it. Please, please, please. I did that. Haven't you done that? I mean, like there was something I wanted. I was like, oh, Lord, just please, 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 please. And it didn't happen. And we tend to think, what did I do wrong? Maybe I didn't yell loud enough. Maybe he's not a good grandpa after all. See, sometimes we think, he didn't do what I wanted. He's not good. And see, I think the whole concept of prayer is very confused. And if the word confusion applies, more than likely, who's involved? The spirits of evil, Satan and others, trying to create confusion and self-condemnation. And I don't think that's what God wants at all in the area of prayer. In fact, we go a little further in um, Thessalonians. It says, pray continually or I put in brackets, without ceasing, because that's what the King James says, and a lot of people remember that, that pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ. That is, it's God's will that you would pray all of the time. Now, if praying all of the time is badgering God, something is wrong. Now, I would say this, that I think praying without ceasing is a heart attitude a heart attitude where i am continually communicating with god whether i am talking with him or listening or worshiping and in fact you can have a prayerful heart attitude even when you are asleep i've had this happen several times where I try to pray every week, like, Lord, what do you want me to teach? And sometimes that comes clearly, and sometimes it's not so clear. But I've had this happen several times where early in the morning, before I awoke, a thought had come into my mind about what I was to teach, and I woke up going, I know that's it. 
And it was like I had essentially a prayerful attitude during the night, and God had spoken something into my heart, and then there it was. And so in every circumstance of life, you can have a heart attitude of prayer. Continuously, without ceasing. Now, that means some of the time, all of the things that you have need of, you're talking to God about. But here's the difference. In my earlier years of Christianity, I was asking God to do... Can you fill in the rest of the story? I was asking him to do my will. Mature prayer is asking God... What is his will? See, that's the complete difference. That we spend a lot of time telling God, this is my will, please do it. Just like the little kid in Lowe's. But mature prayer is, Lord, what is your will? And see, that's night and day different. And if my heart attitude is one of worship and seeking God and prayerful, I can continuously be asking, Lord, what is your will? Constantly. But it's awfully hard to continuously be saying, God, do this for me. It's my will. Do my will. And see, the problem in my early years wasn't that there was something wrong with my system, formula, or quota there was something wrong with my heart's desire. I wanted God to bless what I wanted instead of learning to submit to and honor his will. Now let me ask you this. Is there any circumstance of life in which you cannot say in a prayerful way, God, your will be done? Or ask, what is your will? In other words... Let's say you're a young person, you're dating somebody, and you're just praying that this would all work out perfectly, and Lord, this happened, and you're just, you just got all these requests about this relationship, and then it falls apart, and you're mad at God. It may well be that that was not his will to begin with. I've talked to plenty of young people who dated somebody, and they thought, oh, this was going to happen, and it didn't work out, and then later they married somebody, and they're like, oh, I'm glad that didn't work out with the first one and you see the question is what is God's will in any and every circumstance what does he want in any issue now the scripture says this over in Matthew when you pray do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street quarters to be seen by men So prayer is not something for impressing others. It's not something to do to build up one's pride. I have been in settings where I am confident that people were praying to impress other people. I'm sure they were. Now, they may not have realized that, but I'm sure that's what was going on. Now, that begs the question of why do we pray, like why did I pray before I started teaching? Is that to impress people? No. The primary reason that I will tend to pray like before I teach is I believe in spiritual warfare. And I pray against any spirit of darkness that might bring confusion or distraction or whatever it might be. And we have more of that going on than you might realize. Some, particularly, it seems to happen more at some of the services than others, where there have been plenty of things that were distractions and so forth. One time many years ago, my wife and I were in... Um, in Philadelphia, teaching a seminar at a church. We've been there the whole weekend with a team of people teaching and so forth. And then on a Sunday morning, they had two services. And I think I spoke at one, and this other guy on the team was going to speak at the other one. During the first service, just before I think he was supposed to speak, there was a person in the back who passed out. And literally, the EMT came in during the service and carted this person out during the service. Right? And turns out they weren't in a serious condition, but there was a concern they'd had a heart attack, but they didn't. And then, get this, in the second service, before I'm supposed to speak, literally, a person in the back passed out, 
EMT comes in again and takes them out during that service. Two services, two EMTs. And I, it was amazing, but it was spiritual warfare. I really sensed that about trying to disrupt what was going on there. And there are plenty of times like that. So I pray, not as show, but pray against spirits of darkness. Because when you're praying, you are inviting God into your situation, whatever it might be. And so we don't pray like the hypocrites. And this was, of course, Jesus teaching. And then he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. In other words, that it's just between you and God. Is there any time of life when you cannot pray? I mean, literally, no matter what circumstances, you could be a person who is mute, unable to speak, and you could pray continuously by listening and speaking in your spirit to him. And does he hear that person? Sure. You know what I've prayed in a lot is when I have had a CAT scan in the tube where your nose is about two inches away from the top. You know, it's, if you're claustrophobic, you can't go in there. But, you know, they slide you in there, and they say, you're going to be in there for whatever minutes, you know, and there's like, there's not really a whole lot here to do. I talk to God a lot, you know, because if you focus on where you are, it can be uncomfortable. I'm sure some of you don't like going in there to do that. But I just sit and talk to the Lord and so forth, and things are okay. Finally, they pull you out, and you're like, I had to get out of there. But you see, in every situation, every circumstance, you can pray to the Lord about everything now the scripture also says the very next verse says when you pray don't keep on babbling like the pagans see this is what i thought or in my early days of christianity is i had to say a whole lot of stuff but the scripture says don't keep on babbling for they think they will be heard because of their many words and here to me is the critical verse do not be like them for your father knows what you need before you ask so prayer is not informing a sleepy grandpa about something he is unaware of. God already knows your needs before you ask. Now that begs a question. What is the question? Why ask or why pray? If God already knows your needs before you ask, why bother? Well, I think there are at least two primary reasons. One I've already alluded to. That is that I am inviting God into my circumstance. And I am speaking to the spiritual realm around me, declaring that I am trusting and depending upon Christ. And that no spirit of darkness is going to have authority over this situation because of the name of Jesus. So one of the reasons that we are to pray is to declare to the spiritual realm around us that we are inviting Jesus who has all authority and all power into our circumstance. This is why we are to pray in the name of Jesus, because it is the name that is above all names. There is no name higher, and the spirits of darkness must flee in the power and authority of the name of Jesus. And you and I have the delegated authority to use his name. It's as if you... Um, got a job working, let's say, for the governor of the state of Tennessee, okay? And you went into some organization, and they knew you from before, but they didn't know you'd gotten the job working directly for the governor. And uh, you, you made a request for something, and they sort of laughed at you, and then you gave them your documentation about you are employed by the state, and by law you must submit this information and so forth, that you have delegated authority from one who has responsibility, what well, it's likewise even greater, far greater with the name of Jesus, that you and I have delegated authority to use his name, not as a curse word, which always makes me cringe, but, but to use his name as a powerful name against the spirits of darkness. So first part of prayer is to proclaim to the rest of the world, I'm trusting Christ. The second part of prayer is that you need to express to God, not in order to inform him, but to release from your burdens and hand them to him. He desires to carry the burden with you, for you. And so in praying, and see that scripture that says, um, 
that the peace of God will transcend your heart by prayer and petition, you present everything to him. In presenting everything to him and relying upon him, peace comes because I'm releasing the burden. There are a lot of things in life that are too difficult and too overwhelming for me to deal with on my own. In fact, I understand how young people make it without Christ because they're strong and they got a lot to look forward to and so forth. But by the time you reach middle age, I really do not understand how people make it without Christ. Because there's so many challenges in life and burdens and difficulties and things you deal with that with him you can have peace. Without him, I just don't see how you make it. And, of course, a lot of people reach midlife, and they're making it by escaping or running from responsibility and so forth instead of really walking with Christ. But at least two of the primary reasons we need to pray are not to inform God, but to invite him so that the spirits of darkness know, but also to invite him so that our hearts can have peace. But if there's one primary change in how I've prayed over the years, it is this. I have gone from praying, God, do what I want, to, Lord, what is your will? Instead of asking about, God, I want you to give me this job, I'd be praying, Lord, do you want me to have this, or do you want me to do something else? In fact, I'll tell you this. Before I started working here, I had been working at a college. I'd been there for a number of years. And I had come to a place where I felt like it was coming to an end. And I had started looking for jobs in other colleges, universities, in the realm of what I thought I could um, fit into. And I would apply to a place, and I would get a possibility, and I would think, well, this is going to be, and and they would be talking with me. And every single time, even though it seemed like it was going to work out, the door would shut. And I got a little frustrated. And, of course, I was trying to pray, Lord, what do you want? But at the same time, I'd see some things that I wanted, and I was, like, trying to fit that in there and say, like, Lord, couldn't you want this? You know what I mean? Finally, I got to the point where I just sort of quit, quit looking for a job. And that's when I was asked soon thereafter to work here. And working full-time as a pastor was not on my agenda at that point. And see, the difference was I was wanting to accomplish something that I desired, but I was still trying to say, Lord, what is your will? And then it was clear what his will was. Do you know what was very interesting and quite funny? After I had committed to working here, I started getting job offers. And they were, some of them were like from things from years ago that I would have wanted to do at one point. Uh, Some of them were even fun things that I wanted to do. I wanted to be a ski instructor years ago, and I had the opportunity to do that after I had committed to working here. And see, it was funny. For a while, I couldn't get anything. Then this thing came along, and then it's like... And see, between all that, those job offers afterwards, they just confirmed to me that this is what God wanted because now some spirit was trying to say, hey, don't do that, don't do that, go over here. And see, the difference is, Lord, what is your will in everything? Let me say this. Maybe for many of you this is irrelevant, but for some of you this is critical. Oftentimes, God's will is a more challenging road to undertake. It is not likely to be the easiest road. I say to people, by the way, about this job, I say it's the best job I've ever had in my life, but it is tenfold harder than any job I've ever had. God's best is not usually the easiest road because it is through the more challenging roads that we go through in life that we grow the most. And when I'm praying, Lord, your will... I'm really learning to trust. You know, even Jesus said if there was another way when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, but nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And then Jesus, in the very next verse here in Matthew, said this. This is how you should pray. 
And of course, he goes into what we refer to as the Lord's Prayer, which I'm not going to go all the way into that. I'm just going to talk about the first section. But he said, approach God this way. Recognize that he is your heavenly father. Hallowed be his name means to honor his name, respect his name. And then your kingdom come and what? Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you realize that in heaven there will be no rebellion whatsoever against God's will? And the scripture says God's will is what? Good, pleasing, and perfect. See, if you could somehow take the sin of human beings out of this world just instantly, what would this world be like? Wouldn't it be just a far more wonderful place, peaceful, joyful? I mean, there are a lot of beautiful things in this world, but that beauty is scarred or, or blemished by the sin of humanity. And you see, in heaven, there will be no rebellion, no sin. There will be that perfection and perfect world in which you and I will live. But this scripture says, start out recognizing who is, he is and his will be done. In everything, in everything about which you are praying, the heart attitude should be, Lord, what's your will in this circumstance? Do you want me to take this job or do you want me to take that one? Which one is your will? Do you want me to buy this car or not buy this car? What is your will? You want me to go visit this person? You want me to go spend time here? What is his will? I think I've mentioned before, I don't spend a lot of time asking God for things. In fact, I, I think I have to be honest and say, I don't have any needs. I mean, now we have a lot of things that we want, but if I really am honest, I don't have any needs. You know, if you have food, clothing, and shelter, you're wealthier than 85% of the world's population. And I have all of those. When it comes to genuine needs, I don't have any. And doesn't the scripture indicate that he will meet your needs? He knows, like, like the birds of the air, the scripture says that he feeds them and they don't worry about it. He knows what you have need of. And you seek him and he'll add the things to you that you need. So I don't spend time asking God to do a lot of things because I need things because I don't. Now, there's some people here who probably have some genuine needs. I'm not discounting that. And you should ask and expect him to meet them. But most of the things we're praying about are not needs, they're wants. I have some wants. I've had, I've had this one thing that I have asked God for. It is a want. There's nothing, no other way to describe it except for that. I've had this one thing I have asked him for for nearly 20 years. And so far the answer has not been yes. It hasn't been no. Just hasn't been yes. But it's just a want. I admit that. But now... There's this reality that God wants you to come to him with everything, but see, with, with anything in life, it's what is your will? I'll give you one other little small example. I um, was recently, I started praying for this gentleman, and I heard about his situation, and I knew him, and I started praying for him. And I really, I did not stop to ask, Lord, how should I pray for him? I just started praying what I reasonably assumed was appropriate for his situation. And then a little while later, I backed up and said, Lord, how should I be praying for him? See, I started out with my will for that guy's situation instead of saying, Lord, what is your will for his situation? And it surprised me what I thought the Lord said. Because essentially, I was praying that the Lord would deliver him from the situation he was in. I felt like the Lord said to me, pray that he would have strength to suffer for a season. In other words, I was praying, take him out of that situation. God was saying he's going to be in it for a while. Pray that he would have strength to persevere. Sort of like uh, when Jesus was talking to Peter and, 
And um, he said that Satan has requested permission to sift you, but I've prayed for you. Was Peter going to get sifted? Yeah. But Jesus prayed that he would persevere through it. And see, in that case, it's a small example, but see, I was asking my will for this other person instead of, Lord, what is your will right now with regard to that individual? And see, with every situation, every issue, every person, we should be praying, Lord, what is your will? See, there are a lot of times, like say with your kids or something like that, where you're like, you want to see a great blessing happen in their life and something, and you're praying that this would take place when God is going to take them through a more difficult season of life in order that they would mature. And you naturally want to pray, Lord, don't do that. Because that's going to be hard. But he, in wisdom, allows us to go through things that help us to grow and mature. So I would say this. A, it's not a formula. It's not a system. It's not a quota. It's not about impressing God with the eloquence of my words so that he will do what I want him to do. Prayer is communicating with him constantly. In fact, I spend a lot more time listening now and less time talking in regard to my relationship with Christ. But he does want you to talk with him all the time, I mean, through everything of every day. When, you, when you're having a tough time, it's like, Lord, I, I'm just struggling today. You know how he often helps you when you're struggling? He just sends somebody else along who in some way or another encourages you, gives you hope. Sometimes he sends somebody else along who's going through something far worse than what you're going through and you realize maybe I shouldn't be too upset about my situation. But prayer is about, Lord, here's my life. Everything about it. Tell me what your will is in every circumstance. I want to do your will. See, see, that's a mature approach. And it's something you can do without guilt. You don't have, I don't measure up. You don't have to worry about that. It's, Lord, what is your will? I'll say one last thing. A lot of people feel like that they can't find God's will or they don't know what his will is and things like that. I believe God will make it clear. I really do. If you're listening to him, you're seeing what he's doing in the circumstances around you, he makes it clear. You don't have to fret. Now, sometimes he lets you sort of knock on a lot of different doors before you see his will clearly and things like that. But you don't have to worry. He's not playing some hide and seek game he wants to show you but he wants to show you in his time according to his best so i would encourage you in everything what is his will is the key question of prayer now along that line we want to talk about several things related to prayer you might recall back when we went through a period of fasting earlier in the spring that there were folks in the prayer room daily praying between 9 and 10. And there's some folks still doing that. We would encourage you if you want to stop by to do that. But maybe you're not.